Hello, and welcome to Elevator Pitch Series for the Radiographer. I am Michael, and this is the sixth video in the series on radiographic equipment. In this video, we look at the control of scattered radiation. We learn about what scattered radiation is and the methods of reducing the production of this scatter. In the third video of this series, we learned that scattered X-ray photons are produced during Compton scatter interactions, in which X-ray photons change in direction when they interact with the atomic outer shell electron of tissues. We also pointed out that these occur commonly in high kilovoltage and thick anatomical parts. As for the effects, we pointed out that scattered photons will either make it to the image receptor or go to be absorbed by another body tissue. Because the scattered X-ray photon is a deflected photon, it does not represent the anatomy it is coming from, thus, whenever the scattered photons make it to the image receptor, they place useless densities on the radiographic image. These useless densities diminish the contrast of the radiographic image. There are multiple strategies followed to reduce the amount of scatter on an image. These strategies can be grouped into two. First is the set of strategies that are concerned with reducing the amount of scatter that is produced. The second set of strategies is more concerned with preventing scatter that has been produced from reaching the image receptor. In the first group, we have the use of a low kilovoltage, reducing the thickness of the anatomical part, and restriction on the beam size. In the second group, we have the use of grids and the air gap technique. In this video, we'll be covering the set of approaches that seek to reduce the amount of scattered X-ray photons that are produced. And in the next video, we wrap up control of scattered radiation by looking at approaches that would prevent scatter from reaching the image receptor. High kilovoltage photons are likely to pass through the body tissue easily because of their high energy. Thus, at high kilovoltage, less interactions occur between photons and tissues. Most of the photons simply pass through the tissue without interacting. However, any interactions that do occur at high kilovoltage are more likely to be Compton interactions than photoelectric absorption. And because the kilovoltage is high, the scattered photons usually have sufficient energy to make it to the image receptor and place unwanted densities on the image. This is unlike Compton interactions that occur at low KV. When scattered photons are produced at low KV, they do not have sufficient energy to make it to the image receptor. This is why it is advised to use a low KV when trying to avoid excess of scatter on a radiograph. The next method of reducing the amount of scatter produced is through compression. Like we have mentioned before, the greater the thickness or volume of tissue, the greater the amount of Compton scatter interactions that would occur between photons and these tissues. This implies that, if it were possible to make the tissue have less thickness, less scattered photons will be produced. This is where devices like compression bands and displacement bands come in. A compression band is placed across a part like the abdomen, and what it does is that it displaces some soft tissue to the side, making the part flatter and less thick. As seen on the diagrams below, this reduced thickness will reduce how much scatter is produced. The final approach to reducing the amount of scatter produced that we would be looking at is the use of beam restriction. You would agree with me that, by reducing the width of the X-ray beam, the volume of tissue that the X-ray photons interact with is reduced. When the photons interact with a smaller volume of tissue, less scatter is produced. Also, as you can see on the diagram, when the width of the beam is reduced, a smaller field size is created, and a smaller image receptor is used. Some of the photons produced will bypass this image receptor because of its smaller size. The three common devices used in reducing the width of the beam include aperture diaphragms, cones, and light beam diaphragms. Let us look at these in a bit more detail. First the aperture diaphragm. This is the simplest beam restrictor on the market. It is made of a flat sheet of metal such as lead, and it has a hole in its center. It is attached to the exit port of the X-ray tube. Here's how it restricts the beam. The white beam of photons coming from the X-ray tube will be absorbed by the lead. It is only at the center hole of the diaphragm that photons will pass through. This means that, the white beam coming from the X-ray tube is reduced to a narrow beam by the diaphragm. The advantages of the aperture diaphragm are that it is not complicated to attach and detach from the X-ray tube, and that it is less expensive. However, because it cannot be adjusted, multiple aperture diaphragms need to be purchased for different intended beam sizes. Also, aperture diaphragms produce geometric unsharpness in form of the penumbra effect. Next is the cone. This is also fitted to the exit port of the X-ray tube like the aperture diaphragm. It however differs in that it is not a flat metal sheet. 
it is a cone-shaped tapered structure. This means that it increases from its apex to its base. It is made of brass or steel and is open at its apex and base. It is through these openings that the X-ray beam is shaped into a much narrower form. The width of the field that is produced by a cone can be estimated using a certain formula, field size equals A divided by L plus F all multiplied by D. Where A is the distance between the anode and the image receptor, L is the length of the cone, F is the distance between the narrow end of the cone and the focal spot of the two, and D is the diameter of the white end of the cone. Imagine having to go through the stress of calculating this long equation each time you want to use a cone. That would be quite annoying. To make things easier, the manufacturers usually calculate most of these variables for us into a single figure, which they normally label on the cone. This way, all the radiographer has to do is divide the anode film distance by whatever number is labeled on the cone. For example, if a cone is labeled with the number 4 and it is used with an anode film distance of 90 cm, what field width would be produced? You simply say 90 divided by 4, which gives 22.5, meaning that, at an anode film distance of 90 cm, a cone labeled with 4 will produce a field that is 22.5 cm wide. Even though this is easier than using the big formula on your left-hand side, radiographers tend to stop using this shorter method at some point when they can estimate which cone to use based on experience. Lastly, we have the light beam diaphragm, or collimator. It is the most advanced and sophisticated beam restriction device used in radiography today. In the diagram, you would see it fitted to the X-ray tube exit port. Inside the light beam diaphragm, there are two pairs of movable LED tablets, seen on the image below. The gray knob on the light beam diaphragm in the image above controls the position of these tablets. By turning the knob, a pair of LED tablets are either brought closer or taken farther apart. This allows you to shape the beam into any size. Also, a mirror is placed inside the light beam diaphragm, where it can intersect the path of the X-ray beam. A light bulb is placed opposite this mirror, and what this does is that it enables the radiographer to see the field size created by the collimator. The advantages of this form of beam restriction are that, it is adjustable unlike the cone and diaphragm. You don't have to purchase multiple light beam diaphragms for different field sizes, just one can be adjusted into a wide variety of sizes. Also, less penumbra is produced by the light beam diaphragm. The light field it provides is another great advantage of this device. No need for any calculations, just turn the light on, and you'd get an accurate view of the field size created by the collimator. A light field is shown in the image above, look for a square with a cross. However, the light beam diaphragm is much more expensive to acquire and maintain. Part of this maintenance cost is the light bulb for the visual field, which gets damaged faster than you might expect. That concludes the first part on the control of scattered radiation. We continue in the next video. If you loved this video and would want more content, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Until next time, do enjoy the learning process and take care.